Amen. It's good to see you. Wow. If the rain cannot stop the church from gathering, and there's a forecast, it's everywhere. It's 100%, and it's going to be all day. And you are here, and the people of God are in their churches, local churches, to worship the Lord. Something is happening in the heart of Christianity. No weather, no trial, no circumstance could stop the church of the living God to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. No wonder David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Man. Isn't that great to be reminded that there is a God who awaits you and me to come and worship Him on the day when He raised Himself back to life. Amen? Amen. Welcome to everyone. We're so blessed that you are here. And there's a very special family who's with us today. May I call Meldin and Jerry Lee and their two beautiful children. Uh, who are with us today. Wow. Uh, because of distance also, Melvin used to be our sound man and takes care of everything at the back and he's always behind the scenes. And the last time they were here when uh, we celebrated Faith's uh, 61st birthday. Excuse you? <laughs> okay. He said, what can I do? Uh, they want to serve the Lord. So, Meldin, Jerry Lee, and the beautiful children, welcome and thank you for joining us today. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Welcome back, Arabella. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today is the Lord's Day. So, I would like us to bow our heads and prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Dear Father in heaven, we are blessed to be in your presence. We would rather be here than anywhere. To be reminded of your love demonstrated through your perfect life and your suffering and death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Please, Lord, forgive us of all our sins. Cleanse us thoroughly, make us whiter than snow. Cover us with your blood. Dear Father, we come humbly in your presence, seeking peace, peace, and peace alone with you and us. Thank you, dear Father. I would like to ask just a few moments for each one of us to come to the Lord, just you and Him, and ask Him to... Uh, to just pour out his blessings of forgiveness and grace and to restore you and him in the sweetest fellowship of all. So let's take these few moments. Thank you so much, dear Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers and preparing us for our Lord's Supper, your Supper. We celebrate and we rejoice in what you did for us on the cross. We love you, we praise you, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
before God. He said, be still and know that I am God. Oh, my beloved, we go to the Lord because we cannot do anything on our own. We go to the Lord because we depend on Him. We need Him. Oh, Father, we come to you now. Fill this place with your presence. Pour out your spirit. Touch everyone. And just convict us of our sins. Your righteousness. And your judgment. We are guilty before you in many ways. And yet you love us. And yet when we come to confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. You alone, you alone can take us as we are. Nothing hidden. All our mistakes, all our failures. Oh, Father, thank you for loving us. Will you, could, will you just continue to touch our lives that we may never be the same, that you will just continue to change us from glory to glory, that you will just continue to help us to please you every day in our lives. Oh, Father, I ask you to just touch every marriage that are represented here and even those who are watching online. Oh, Father, touch the lives and the hearts of those husbands and wives that they may fear you so that they will learn to submit to you and to each other, that they will be responsible to do what you have commanded them to do, to respect each other and to love each other and to cherish each other. Oh, Father, strengthen our marriages, Lord. And our children, will you just help our children overcome all the challenges along the way as they are growing up. Help them to have excellent choices as they are now growing up, Lord. They can do things that are even beyond our imagination. But help them, Father. Lead them, Father, in the path of righteousness for your namesake. Preserve them from this evil and wicked generation. And those who are cold and far away from you, draw them closer to you. Oh, Father, will you remember our sick? You know them, Lord. Sister Lucy, waiting for kidney transplant. For Tatai Sidi, for Brother Tom, for a miracle. For, and all our seniors who are having aches and pains. Will you just remember them all? Our brethren in Hawaii, Sister um, Marine, Lord, for her arm. She has been waiting for healing on her arm so that she can go back to work. Evelyn, complete recovery. Even Auntie Mati. And Lord, uh, whoever I have not mentioned, will you just be near them and just assure them of your loving kindness. Lord, we also remember our brother Tim and sister Susan as they, uh, <clears throat> as they uh, prepare, Lord, for their movie. Lord, we only want that they will be safe, that they will triumph in this, in this movie production, that you will just bless them tremendously, give them wisdom as they run everything, give them good health, Lord. Father, bless them, bless them, and all our people, Lord, will you continue to just cause them to be excited for your goodness, for your care, for your loving kindness. Oh, Father, there are so many of all the Lord who are crying out, asking for the desires of their heart. Will you just give it, Lord, but not to the leanness of their soul, but that they will really enjoy and be blessed. Father, thank you very much for how you will just be with our servant as they speak your word. Put 
the words in his mouth, the words that we need to challenge us, to, to convict us, and, and even, Lord, to continue our pursuit of holiness, our pursuit of the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, flood this, soul, flood this place with your presence and be merciful upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all this. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is our Lord's Supper day, but we will do the Lord's Supper immediately after our message because this message is connected, it is significant in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> so, uh, this is the fifth of the six messages that comprises our series for such a time as this. And we know that God had blessed us tremendously with the first four already. We determined to know that for such a time in our life that we know and discover the plot of the enemy. What is the plot of our enemy? To steal, kill, and destroy. That's from John chapter 10, verse 10. We must also know the plan of the Lord. Discern. The Lord's plan. In that same text in John chapter 10, verse 10, we know that God told us, I came that they may have life that is salvation. And that they may have it more abundantly that is abundant life that is sanctification. So we can serve the Lord. With all these things that are happening, we know that God demands each one of us to grow mature. As the Lord had demanded Mordecai and Esther in preparation for such a time as this. For Mordecai, to go about and declare the plan of Haman. And then to proceed and discharge whatever Esther had requested of Mordecai to do. And that is to call upon the people from all the 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia under Ahasuerus or King Xerxes. So they could pray and fast for three days and nights for Esther. And for Esther, God's demand is for her to secure all the information so she can make a decision regarding the saving of her own people from the hands of a man. And then the last demand of God from Esther regarding this is to present herself unsummoned before the king. And then she says, if I perish, I perish. Because we know we have the Middle Persian law that says no one is allowed to enter the presence of the king unsummoned or else she or he would lose his or her head unless 
the king graciously extends his scepter upon that person. And then we have the detailed plan. It was a detailed plan of Esther. It's so beautiful. The detailed plan is, Mordecai, tell all the people to pray. And then on the third day, I will put on my queen's apparel and enter into the presence of the king and summon. If I perish, I perish. That's the plan. That's the detailed plan. Do we have a plan? Whenever we're facing annihilation, not that you are going to be annihilated, but the devil said, I came to steal, kill, and destroy. And you and I are taking this for granted. He's stealing our children. He has stolen a lot of our children already. They don't want to come to church. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't even want to pray. This obedience has kind of crept into their heart. What happened to the generation that will follow you? And we don't care about the plan of the devil when he says that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And we leave as if nothing is happening. So we need not only to discover the plot of the enemy, to discern the plan of God, to discharge the demands of God for our spiritual maturity. He uses the scripture for us to grow. He gives us the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit so we can discover, develop, and deploy this in our service to the King. He gives us sufferings and trials so we grow through all of this as Paul has said. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Yes, God demanded from Esther and Mordecai, and they discharged what they were asked to do. We also must discharge. Do it. Complete it. All that God requires for us to grow in the beauty and knowledge of Christ. The last part of the detailed plan for us to grow is that we must have a personal involvement in this. In the sanctifying process, God gave us the Holy Spirit. God allowed the Word of God for you to have. He also gave us spiritual gifts. He sends trials. But Jesus will not come to church for you. He will not open the Bible for you. He will not kneel down and pray beside your bed, so he will pray for you. No, you and I have to do that. Jesus will not go out and knock on doors to share the gospel. We have to do that. And when all these detailed plans were fulfilled by Mordecai and Esther, the next thing that happened is that God delivered them. This is now what we call the divine intervention of God. For such a time as this, there will come a divine intervention if we know the plan of the devil, if we discern the plan of God, if we discharge the demands of the Lord, if we have detailed plans to know what to do in the midst of these trials and problems posed before us by our enemy, the devil, and you will see the divine intervention in your life and mine. For Esther, how did God deliver his divine intervention? Remember, Esther would lose her head. Death hovers over Esther. She's about to lose her life, lose her throne in pursuit for this desire to save her own people, so she decided to enter into the presence of the king and summon death staring in your face as Esther experienced. But what did God do to intervene from death to life? Because Xerxes, the king, extended his scepter 
on the head of Esther and said, Queen, what do you want me to do for you? Even to half of my kingdom will be given to you. So divine intervention happened in the life of Esther. Hasn't God performed divine interventions in your life already? But you say, Pastor, I'm still in a big trouble. God hasn't intervened yet. He intervened from the very moment you entered into this world. And he keeps intervening even though you don't feel, even though you don't see. God's hands is there all the time, intervening in your behalf and mine for all of us who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. How about Mordecai? Mordecai, a gallows was prepared for him. But what happened? When Esther told the king what Haman was planning, the king left the banquet place and entered into the garden palace. He was so furious when he learned that his prime minister was the one who is planning to destroy the kings of his queen, Esther. And of course, you know, Haman was begging Esther. And the queen's bed is just in the banqueting hall. Because their halls are huge. There's the bed. There's the table for feasting and all that. And so the queen was sitting in her bed, on her bed. And comes Haman as he was begging for his life. He was hovering over the queen and the king suddenly enters back into the palace and he saw Haman like hovering over his wife and he thought, is he going to rape my wife too? He already planned to destroy his king's folk and now he wants to rape my wife. And one of the chamberlains heard this feat of the king. He said, king... Actually, Haman prepared a gallow to hang Mordecai. Uh, to hang, uh, yes, Mordecai. And, and the king said, hang Haman in that gallow. And so God intervened in the life of Mordecai from gallows to glory. Because at that very moment, the king not only ordered the killing of Haman, the worst enemy, of the people of Israel in exile in Babylon, he also took the ring, that signet ring the king has entrusted to Haman to stamp on anything that will become a Medo-Persian law. And so the king took that ring and gave it to Mordecai. What a glorious deliverance, amen? Haven't you experienced that? Maybe you say, no, pastor, man, not even close. I haven't had that kind of experience. All my life, I haven't that kind of experience. Wait, just wait. Because you have experienced even more than that. For the people of Israel, how did God intervene in their behalf? Man. So when the king entrusted the, the ring to Mordecai, Esther came to the king for the second time unsummoned. The same way. The first time he could lose, she could lose her head. The second time again, she could again lose her head. But for the love of, his, of her people, she did it again. And unsummoned entered into the presence of King Xerxes. And of course, King Xerxes extended his scepter. And Esther was spared again. That's a great experience of divine deliverance, isn't it? But that's not really even close with your experience and mine. But going back to the people of Israel, the king said, My queen, what, what do you need now? Even to half of my kingdom, I'll give to you. And Esther said, King there is a Medo-Persian law 
that commands the people of Babylon to destroy my people. I need help to do something to stop it. The king said, I don't have any power to reverse that law. But since I have given my ring to Mordecai, then write a law. Write a law, a counter edict that will counter that law. And so Mordecai and Esther start writing a law that says, all the Jews from all the 127 provinces under King Xerxes, you are given the authority and right to defend yourself and kill anyone who will be after your family, your life, your livelihood, and everything about you. So that was a counter edict. And so what happened? How did God deliver the people of Israel who were in exile in Babylon from destruction to deliverance? Amen? Amen. So that's the divine intervention of God for Esther from death to life, Mordecai from gallows to glory, and for the people of Israel from destruction to deliverance. Oh. When that thing happens, what do we do? When we see the intervention of the Lord in our life, what do we do? Declare God's glory. Amen? We have to declare God's glory. There's no more timidity. Stop being quiet or shy. God had delivered you. God had blessed you. God had protected you. He vanquished the enemies for you. In His divine intervention, the only plausible, the only logical, the best response to all the divine intervention God had done for you, your life, your family, is to declare God's glory. Amen? To declare God's glory. Why? Because, first of all, God commanded us to do all things for His glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, he said, do it all for the glory of God. Amen? Do it all for the glory of God. So what are we waiting for? Declare the glory of God for things that happen in our life daily. Have you glorified the Lord because you have oxygen to breathe every day? Even when you're sleeping, when you're driving, when you're taking a bath, and all that's happening in your life, God has not withheld oxygen. For if He only took five minutes to bring out all the oxygen of the atmosphere, you and I will be clinically dead. Isn't that a great way to be reminded of God's divine intervention that you're still alive today? And also the rain. Many of us are mad at the rain. We would comment negatively because of the rain. How many of you were happy today that your plants and your grass are all watered to the fullest? And you didn't spend any money. You know, you have your wipers when you came to church. So what are we complaining for? And you have gas in your car because of the goodness of God. He gave you the ability to work so you can be provided with everything you need according to His riches in glory. That is the goodness of God. We have to declare God's glory. Amen. Amen. And then we also know that in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for our good anyway. Isn't it? If it works for our good, anything, everything, your sickness, anything, separation, your, your headache, your, your pain, anything that you experience, if it works together for our good, then we have to declare the glory of God. Oh, by the way, God also intervenes by turning the hearts of people 
the way he wills for your good. Whenever somebody comes to me, Pastor, can you pray for my boss? Can you, or I'm applying for a job, can you please pray for me? I pray Proverbs 21 verse 1. You know what that says? The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Replace that king there with your boss. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Like a mighty river, he turneth it wherever he wills. Not your will, he wills. And so he intervenes by touching the heart of your employers. The authorities that are above you. Children, pray. Proverbs 21 verse 1 regarding your parents. If they Stand firm in their decision. Pray. Proverbs 21 verse 1 for you. Please turn my heart, Lord, that I may submit to the decisions of my loving authority. So there it goes. Oh, by the way, not only that. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament show it his handiwork. Day unto day uttered speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out to the end of the earth, and their voices to the end of the world. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. We need to declare the glory of the Lord. He even said, if you will not praise me, I will command the stones to lift up their voice. To praise me. He said, the sucklings, they are better at praising the Lord with their cries when they're begging for milk. Because their praise is pure. They are responding to the instinct that God had given to them to cry when they need something. We need to declare the glory of the Lord. And you know, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. He said, there was a day when I saw the Lord in his glory and his splendor. And what happened that day? Oh, Isaiah felt so unworthy that when he saw the whole earth is full of the glory of God, he said, woe is me. For I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. We bring, we declare, we manifest the glory of God when he works in our life. To show how far we are from the holiness that he desires from us. So we realize that distance and ask him to help us to draw close to him. In that way, you and I will follow the Lord in righteousness. And declare the glory of God. When we see how holy he is. And how undone we are. So, <clears throat> declaring God's glory... For the people of Israel was demonstrated through the Feast of Purim. Okay? So I have illustrated almost everything that will lead us to the Feast of Purim. How did the people of Israel, as God had intervened for, for their deliverance, how did they declare the glory of God? You know, there was no feast of Purim established by God in the Old Testament. Nothing. This is not part of the original feast that God has established for the people of Israel to celebrate. But the feast of Purim was established mainly for the people of Israel to be reminded of God's intervention and that they would remember God, that he was the one. Who did it? So the Feast of Purim, the meaning is taken from the Hebrew word pur, P-U-R, which means lots. You know, draw lots, cast lots. Because Haman cast lots to determine the date of the genocide. 
He determined the date of the genocide by draw lots. Like, what day do you want us to kill all the Jews? Oh, let's, let's put the dates. Or you say, this is the calendar for a whole year. Blindfold me and I will just turn around and point at the date and that will be it. So that's how they did it. They just cast lots. And the lot fell on the 13th day of Adar. A-D-A-R. Which is actually between February and March in our calendar. But in the calendar of the Jews, there's the 12th, the 12th month, Adar. And it happened nine months before. Nine months before that, when they established the Pur. So the people of Israel have nine months to worry, to fear, and to lose their mind, if you will, because of the threat. That they will lose everything. Purim is taken from the word poor. Because Haman drew lots on what day the genocide will happen. What is the significance of the Feast of Purim? This is a Jewish holiday that celebrates the deliverance of the Jewish people from annihilation by Haman. Just simple as that. The thing is, in our generation today, so many can change parties anytime. When one party is in charge, the other uh, party, many of them shift to this party. So you don't even identify who your enemy is anymore. And then when this party wins, all of those will also come and join. Not with the Jewish situation. They know all the Jewish people. And they have the sentence of death upon them. And it happens. even to the Jews in this generation because they are hated everywhere. But there's a command for us according to Psalm 122. It says, The day that love Israel will be blessed by the Lord. God will curse them that curse Israel. So this Jewish holiday is a day to celebrate the deliverance. Are we celebrating God's deliverance in our life? Well, what's the time of the celebration? I told you already, February or March, the 14th day and the 15th day of Adar. Why? Because the 13th is the day when the edict was written by Haman to destroy all the Jews. On that 13th day when it came, the people of Israel were ready because Mordecai and Esther wrote a counter edict. So now they have the right to defend themselves. And did you know that 75,000 Babylonians were killed by the Jews on the 13th day of Adar? That's just in the 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. How about in the capital city of Babylon, which is Shushan? 13th day of Adar, 500 Babylonians were killed. 500. On the 14th, the second day, another 300 were killed. So a total of 75,800 people were killed because God intervened and delivered Israel from sure annihilation. So, in Esther chapter 9, verse 27, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. So, if you are a Gentile and you 
uh, become by, by uh, naturalization a Jew, so you can join them, that the celebration should not stop, should not fail, that they would keep these two days, the 14th and the 15th of Adar, according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed, meaning the generations that would follow. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that great? Now we understand what the Feast of Purim is. But what is the manner of celebration of the Feast of Purim? In verse 22, Esther chapter 9, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, meaning on that day, 13th of Adar, the fighting started. It ended the following day, the 14th. So the people in the 127 provinces were already celebrating. But in the capital city in Shushan, oh, after 500 were killed on the 13th, many more Babylonians tried to kill the Jews that were in the capital city. And 300 more were killed. So what they did was to take the 14th and the 15th together and use it to celebrate their deliverance. How did they do it? The month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day that they should make them days of feasting and joy sending portions. It's like Christmas, one to another and gifts to the poor. Isn't that good? You know? So, for us, if it's our birthday, you know, it's, it's, it's across the board, okay, me and everyone. I know there are birthday celebrants for September or October. Who are the birthday celebrants for October? I think there's a lot. You know, we expect gifts, but they were celebrating their own deliverance by giving gifts to one another. So that's a good practice, isn't it? So the feast to celebrate, the feast to celebrate with the feast of Purim is a reminder that all of us have experienced the intervention of God. You say, but the way God intervened in my life is nowhere close to anything related to God's intervention in the past that God has established his own feast about it. You know what? Now that we know how the people of Israel declared the glory of God, going back to God's intervention in their life as a nation, and allowing the process through which God had intervened in every aspect. Just look at this. Even from the foundation of the world, God has already established his plans to intervene in our life. God planned to save the Jews that were in exile from the evil plot of Haman. God prophesied through Jeremiah that he'll discipline his people by exile for 70 years for violating the Sabbath years. God raised an orphan Jewish girl named Hadassah, meaning star, the cousin of Mordecai, an orphan under Mordecai's care. And then, years after that, God put in place this man named Xerxes to be king. And on his third year, 
he set up this feast which after 160 days, which is half of the year, six months, he asked for Vasti, his wife, to display to all his visitors, but Vasti refused. So God made Xerxes to call for Vasti's dethroning. She is no longer the queen of Babylon. God caused that to happen. And then he caused the nobles and princesses to recommend to Ahasuerus or Xerxes to find a younger lady, pure, virgin, beautiful, worthy to replace Vasti. Well, three years later, the king ordered all the virgins to a certain age to come to the palace so he can choose one to be his queen. He caused Esther, God caused Esther to find favor with the king's chamberlain who was in charge of all the women in the king's house. And then God made Xerxes the king to choose Esther as queen. Don't you see? Don't you see the history, the sequence of how God was intervening? Even before Haman wrote that genocidal note against the people of Israel, God was already putting Esther in place. He had been working before you met your wife. God was already working before you met your husband. God was already working before your children were born. God was already working. And you children, before you were born, God's work is evident in your life already. You may not know it, you may not see it, but God's hands are so obvious in your life and mine, especially you who are under the canopy of God's love through His mercies. He has forgiven you so you will have everlasting life. If he made Xerxes to choose an orphan girl, a Jewish girl, can he not do that same thing for you? What problem do you have? What are you going through right now? Is it too much for you? And does that translate also for you to think that it's too much for the Lord to handle? Even before things happen, he already knows. And if he knows, you and I have the confidence that God is working in his ministry of intervention, whether you know it or not. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and how did Mordecai come to the picture? He saved the king. From two would-be assassins. It was recorded in the book of Chronicles. But nobody noticed it. And the king entirely forgot it. And never really repaid or honored Mordecai. Well. Setting aside Mordecai. He promotes Haman. God caused Xerxes to promote Haman. Who put Biden on the throne. The Democrats, the Uni Party, China, or God. He uses everything and anything because he has a plan. And I don't know. But I know who God is. We don't need to know what his plan is. We just have to be ready because God is all-knowing and sovereign. He doesn't need to consult you or me. He just does what he wills, and it's always perfect, even though they don't look like it is perfect, isn't it? Wow. So he causes Mordecai to refuse to bow before Haman, which caused Haman to hate Mordecai 
and then learn that Mordecai is part of the Jewish exiled people. Ah, oh, so now he lures the king, tells him there is a bunch of people here who don't care about your law. And it does not profit you to keep them here. Why don't you write an edict? Sign it with your ring and let's destroy them because they are no good for you and this country anyway. The king was deceived. So he caused Mordecai to come to the king's gate when he learned about the problem. And he would put on sackcloth and go around crying around the city of Shushan and then landed at the king's gate. Nobody is allowed to stand in the king's gate, especially in sackcloth, or they will be killed. But why did God give Mordecai the courage even though I will die? I will stand there so my niece, uh, my, my cousin Esther would know that there's a problem. And so when Esther learned that her cousin Mordecai is there on sackcloth, in sackcloth, he said, this is not, this is not good. Tell Uncle Mordecai to put on this good apparel but Mordecai refused it and then he sent for Hatak one of the chamberlains and said what's the problem tell Esther she must do something about it or she and her family will die she thinks she'll be spared no so the news came to Esther said what we're all gonna be killed who did it hey man and so Esther said pray who caused Esther to ask the people to pray? God. And he said, fast and pray. And then I will stand in the presence of the king if I perish. I perish. Who caused all of those things? It's God, isn't it? It's God. Wow, and then God turned the heart of Xerxes to show kindness to Esther. He gave a plan to Esther to expose Haman. To King Searches, who gave the plan to Esther? God. He caused Haman to be sad because of Mordecai in spite of his powerful position and wealth. Because Mordecai was not bowing to him. So his wife said, Sarah his wife, why don't you put up a gallows so you can hang Mordecai? That night the king could not sleep. He, he looked at the book of Chronicles and he saw there, Mordecai saved me. From two of my doormen here who were would-be assassins to kill me. Has anyone, uh, has, has anything been done for this man who saved my life? And they said, no. He couldn't sleep. It's morning. <laughs> and, and Haman was so excited because the gallows are there. And Haman was ready to hang Mordecai. So he runs to the palace and as he was running to the palace you know he was thinking man this is the day i'll be so happy because M mordecai is going to hang on my gallows the king couldn't sleep and then he said uh what has been done for this man mordecai none 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 king and then Haman comes in and the king said who's there Oh, it's Haman, king. Oh, let him in, let him in. And, and the king said, Haman, what should the king do for a man he delights in? And, and Haman thought it was him. No, whoa, the king is going, oh, he's delighted in me. That's why he promoted me. So what will I tell him to do for me? He said, oh, bring out the, the horse that you rode upon. Put on the apparel that you used. And then... Give him the crown that you wear and then get a very prominent man to pull the horse and go around the town of Shushan and declare to the people, this is how the king would honor the man that he delighted. And so, so Haman said, yes, I made it. I made it. And then the king said, do it for Mordecai. <laughs> All the excitement. Oh, man, the balloon popped. And so he was declaring to all the people that God delights in Mordecai, not him. But the gallows was already there. Who did all of those? It's God. 
Why did God make you to be a nurse, a farmer? Why did God cause you to be this and to be that? It's God. I always complain. When I was in high school, I dreamt of becoming a lawyer so I can become a politician like my dad. And for many years, I've been complaining. I even rebelled against my mom. My, my, my siblings know how I rebelled against my mom. Because she and my dad, before my dad died, had planned that the oldest son of seven must become a doctor. No, no escape. The oldest must become a doctor. Then I'm the oldest. But I want to be a doctor. I rebelled against my mom for 10 years while I was studying to be a doctor, rebelling every day against her, complaining. And even now, there are times when I use that. Ah, I should have been a politician, maybe the president of the Philippines right now. Oh, man. Because that's my dream. My dad was a mayor. I said, no, 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 no. Mayor's not my my type, higher. I want to go higher. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> and now I realize it's God's plan. I'm here with you. And I'm preaching the word of God. How have I wasted all my life complaining? <sighs> Why mom put me through this rigorous life to become a doctor? Who put me there? It was God. Because every day I traveled, when I started to grow in the Lord, I would travel from Manila to Cavite, three rides. It takes me two and a half to three hours just to reach the hospital where I, I am uh, on duty. Every day, I complain to God, Lord, why? Why this, Lord? And then one of those days, I was uh, quiet in that, uh, in that uh, uh, train, God just spoke to me in my spirit and said, <laughs> maybe he said, you fool. Maybe he said, I just didn't hear it. But I think that was it. Like, don't you understand, Cicero? Every day you take the trip. That's your trip to heaven. You might as well enjoy it. You drive every day to work. Enjoy it. That's your trip to heaven. Don't ever complain. Because that's the trip that God had given you on your way to heaven. Enjoy it. Grow through it. Grow mature through it. Be grateful to God for every moment that you are on your way wherever God wants you to go. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life complaining. But how about my sufferings? That's also part of the trip, guys. It's when you invoke the power of God to help you. That he intervenes and you will see the glory of God declared in your life. And you can't even imagine. Wow. God is declared in his glorious splendor in my life even though I'm just like this. I have so many problems. Yes. Because God turns ashes into beauty. <clears throat> well. Let me close before we do our Lord's Supper and then we close. You know, I, I talk about the celebration. I mean, there's so much more here that God really did intervene in everything. He caused this, he caused that, he caused this person, he caused that person. He did this, he did this. Even if the people didn't know he was doing it, he was doing it. Amen? So now how about us? You say, Pastor, they're celebrating the Feast of Purim because it's just totally, totally, oh man, magnificent. It's awesome deliverance. But me, I don't think I've ever been delivered like they were. Come on, guys. Are you so forgetful? You were supposed to go to hell like me. We're all supposed to pay the wages of our sin, which is death in hell forever. Separated from God, from all of the beauty and grandeur of heaven, the grace of God, the mercies of God. And then he sent his son to be born to a virgin. 
lowly of heart and humble, meek, he lived a perfect life. In due time, he prayed to God, not my will, but thine be done. He accepted the will of the Father. He went to the cross, suffered and died, not for his sins, but for yours and mine. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Divine intervention. He said, nobody takes my life away. I give it. He dismissed his spirit. And he died physically. He was buried. But on the third day, he rose again. According to scriptures. He defeated our worst and final enemy. Your enemy and mine, which is death. That's the worst and final enemy. Not any Democratic Party or Republican or Uni Party or any media mogul or World Economic Forum or World Health Organization. The communist countries around the world. The big pharma. The big media moguls. The Bible says... We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, put unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. They are not our enemies, the devil, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Not your wife, not your husband. Spiritual wickedness in high places. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. Has come to destroy you, your marriage, <clears throat> destroy the hopes of your children. But if you allow God to work in your life, He can restore beauty out from the ashes of failure. You will rise up like a phoenix and you will be able to declare the glory of God in the end. Today, there are three feasts I want to close with that you and I are already privy to. We celebrate them, but we don't have the foundation to really know how important these feasts are that we celebrate. The first one is baptism. We must celebrate baptism. Jesus said to, to John, John, let it be so for now, for in this way we do all righteousness. You want to do all righteousness? Start with obeying the Lord and believers' baptism. Requirement is that you be baptized with the Holy Spirit first. Allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life. Be saved. Be sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And then obey the Lord in believers' baptism. Our latest family who obeyed the Lord in believers' baptism is the Alva family. We're so grateful. Many of us were there. We celebrated with them. But in my heart, I rejoiced and declared the glory of God. Declare the glory of God when you obey the Lord in believers' baptism. Celebrate that with joy, with excitement, with gratitude. That you first were baptized in the Holy Spirit, meaning you're saved. Isn't that a great opportunity to celebrate a feast when you are celebrating your own salvation experience? Amen? Amen. There's a second, and that is the Lord's Supper today. That's why we will do the Lord's Supper immediately after this. Because I need you to understand, Lord's Supper is the declaration of what Jesus did for us on the cross when he suffered and died for our sins. Amen? We need to do that. That's why every time you celebrate the Lord's Supper, don't take it for granted. Be reminded of the suffering of the Savior. Be reminded of Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Amen. The Lord's Supper. 
is a feast to celebrate that we may declare the glory of God. When there's baptism, let's go and be witnesses of that declaration of the glory of God. During the Lord's Supper, let's be worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. And remind yourself, first Sunday, it is the Lord's Supper. I need to be there. I will celebrate God's faithfulness because He intervened in my eternal destiny. Amen? And the last one is our day of worship. Today, every Sunday, we come and celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This is Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ because that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is that same power that will raise you and me from the dead when the day comes when he shall appear in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive, if it happens today, we will be caught up together and meet the Lord in the air and shall be with him forever. Will you take seriously these three feasts that we can celebrate. To celebrate all of this with one purpose. To declare the glory of God. Have you declared God's glory through your obedience to water baptism? Maybe some of you have not submitted yourself to water baptism. Maybe you say, I was baptized when I was young. Well, do you understand? Did you understand why you were baptized? It's not too late. I'd be willing to explain to you. And it's not sin to say, I want to be baptized, Pastor, now that I understand. Even though you were baptized when you were young, but you didn't fully understand, now you can make the decision to obey the Lord in believer's baptism. Make it a serious matter. Because you're declaring the glory of God. And also, when you obey the Lord and believers' baptism, you know what he says? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You may not hear it with your physical ears, but you must listen with your spirit. God is declaring, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. I hope you will make a decision, Pastor. I, I, I want to be baptized. Please come and teach me what it means that I may make the right decision. The Lord's Supper, when we gather together, remember we celebrate the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we declare his glory because he said, do this in remembrance of me. Why will he ask us to do it? To remember him. Remember him. We declare his glory. Amen. Amen. And take seriously Sunday after Sunday. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some are already doing. Instead, let's encourage each other all the more since the day of the Lord is coming nearer. Amen. Let's bow our heads and let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Father, for teaching us how to declare your glory. Oh, thank you for using the Feast of Purim as a demonstrable uh, piece of event to celebrate your faithfulness to the Jewish people. But you've been faithful, Lord. You did not renege on your commitment to become the kinsman redeemer who would come to take our place and die at the altar. Of sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. Thank you for dying for us on the cross and saving us from the fires of damnation and hell forever. Oh, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you. As our heads are bowed and I closed, you're here today and you heard God's decisive divine intervention every step along the way not only in the lives of the Jewish nation but in your life and mine as well what have you done in return 
for God's intervention in your life? Have you obeyed the Lord in believer's baptism? Or were you baptized but you didn't fully understand what it means? But today, if you want to obey the Lord in believer's baptism, maybe your first step is to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I, I need explanation. I need you to teach me so I can understand and I will make my decision. Is there anyone who wishes to understand baptism more than you ever understood before? Is there anyone who wishes to learn more about baptism? Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand and I will uh, make sure to uh, explain to you if you are here today. Or if you won't be able to raise your hand, you approach me and privately let me know so I can set up an appointment to explain to you, okay? But if you are here today or watching, you don't have a personal relationship with the Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Today is the day. Remember, Jesus completed all the requirements for salvation. All you and I have to do is to accept that we are sinners. We must embrace our unworthiness, our inability, our helplessness to save ourselves. That's number one. Number two, we must believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, is the only way for our salvation. Number three, we have to accept Him into our heart as Savior and Lord. Would you like to accept Jesus into your heart as Savior and Lord and be saved today? If you want to do that, I will pray a simple prayer. I will ask you to pray with me right now, okay? Let us pray. Dear God, I accept that I am a sinner. Please forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. I accept I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life as my Savior and Lord today. Thank you for saving me and giving me everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. <clears throat> May I ask our deacons to please come? And uh, we will now celebrate the Lord's Supper. Amen. Wow. Now you know why we left this last. So you and I can understand the significance of the celebration itself. You can distribute the elements now, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. As you, uh, as you receive the, the cup, There are two elements that are here, the unleavened bread on top and the cup that holds the unfermented juice. These are two elements that represent the blood and the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior suffered on the cross. His purpose is to pay the ransom so we can obtain freedom. His life for our life. His crown. He took the crown of thorns so we can have the crown of life. Today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. 
do it as often as you can in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Drink it as often as you can in remembrance of me. For as, you, as often as you eat the bread and drink from the cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. There is a time that we need to celebrate again and again and again while waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ called the rapture. I also call it the resurrection of the church, the believers. So today, the Lord's Supper demonstrates to us that God loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son with the purpose that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish in hell but have everlasting life. So this is how God demonstrated His love. Number one, He became a man. Jesus Christ left heaven and was born to a virgin. He lived a perfect life. Jesus lived a perfect life because we need a perfect substitute that is acceptable to the Father. Amen? Number three, Jesus suffered and died. You know, Jesus suffered and died. He took upon Him the penalty for our sins. And then, He was buried, but on the third day, He defeated death by rising from the grave. And then, He ascended up to heaven, but He promised to all His disciples, which is a promise to you and to me also, that He will come again and take you for where he is there you may be also so today I will ask you to hold the elements and I will ask you to bow your heads close your eyes and let us pray dear father in heaven thank you thank you for the significance of the celebration of this feast the Lord's Supper. How you suffered and died for us. And how that through these elements, this unleavened bread representing the sinless, perfect, broken body of the Lord Jesus because of our sins. And because of his love for us, he spilled his blood to cleanse our sins away. Bless these two elements, Lord, and help us be reminded that as we celebrate your suffering and death through partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remember that as we do it, we declare the glory of God by celebrating again and again until he comes. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open uh, and expose the unleavened bread. Okay, and please raise it with me. This is unleavened bread. No leaven because leaven represents sin. Jesus was sinless and he gave his body to be broken for you and me. That night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it and do it as often as you can in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. You can now expose the juice. Open it. After
after supper, you may sit with me. The Lord Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This is the New Testament in my blood. Drink it as often as you can in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. For as often as you eat the bread and drink from the cup, what do we do? We show the Lord's death, His resurrection, and His coming again in the air. Amen? Amen. Well, let's all stand. And I would like us to, uh, <clears throat> to pray. Uh, did we gather our tithes today? Brother Tom and uh, Brother uh, Russell, would you please come to the front? Okay. Uh, uh, standing. Uh, remain standing. It's easier for you to pull something if you are standing. Father, thank you. Brother Dennis, please come. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give God praise and glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> we get ready for tithes and offering. Amen. And uh, what the Word of God says in um, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and runneth over, shall men give unto your bosoms. With the same measure that ye meet with all shall be measured unto you. Now, as we give our tithes and offering, just know in your heart that you are blessed. You are blessed no matter what you're going through. Why? But when we give our tithes and offering, it's for his glory. Because God knows our heart. If pain is in your heart, you just remove it in the name of Jesus. If anxiety is in your heart, you just remove it in the name of Jesus and you focus on him and give him what truly belongs to him. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we give our tithes and offering to you, Lord, continue, Heavenly Father, to search our hearts so that we give it to you in spirit and in truth as we also praise you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all things that you are doing in our lives, Lord. No matter if it's going good, no matter if it's going bad, we know that you are ultimately, Heavenly Father, giving us victory, Lord. Let these tithes and offerings, Heavenly Father, be used for your kingdom, for your glory. But at the same time, Heavenly Father, use each and every one of us here, Lord, to be the light that shines, Lord, in this darkness, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, in the church say, amen. amen. Now for those that are giving online, amen, you can give to the Zell account at tgifchurchgiving at gmail.com. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, before we uh, close with our benediction, uh, please uh, be uh, informed the 15th, 15th, which is today is 1st, 8th, and the 15th. We won't have any uh, fellowship or lunch here. So, if our uh, food committee will just put something that we can take with us, that's good. If not, then uh, we will start our Sunday school immediately, uh, leave the place be, and uh, we will be able to uh, uh, work with our host church uh, that day. The 22nd is preach upon, not the last Sunday, okay? The 
fourth Sunday is 22. It is preachable. So remember that too. So we still have food on that Sunday. I like, I like that we have uh, food together so we can enjoy a fellowship after the preachathon. Talk to our preachers, thank them for their labor of love, and thank their family because their family takes a portion of that sacrifice. Uh, whatever the man uses, the time to spend preparing, that's taken away from their family. So we are grateful. To all our preachers, we are so grateful. Our uh, brother Enrique, uh, was, it was his first time last Sunday. How did he do? Amen. Mm, mm. So looking forward to our preachers this coming October 22. And I'm excited every time. Looking forward to hearing every one of you. Well, uh, just a moment. Because this is very important. Mm. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and just make the announcements. <clears throat> Sunday school for the women will be in room 10, which is the last room down the hall. The young mothers with Sister Dana. So room 10 with Sister Doris, young moms with Sister Dana in room number four, which is also the nursery. The commit college and career will be in the fellowship hall today. And the men will be in room number six, right before the main restrooms. Okay. Bible study. Uh, this week we have the commit on Monday. And we are still in the book of Jonah with Brother Bez. For Wednesdays, we still have the Revival Nights starting at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays here in the Fellowship Hall. Fridays, you know the Forevers. Uh, if you are uh, interested in attending that, please speak with Sister Bing. And also, just to update you, the Israel trip will be pushed to November to give us more time to pray about it and to save. Uh, if you save about $15 a day or $100 a week, you will be able to save enough for the trip to the Holy Land. November. So keep yeah. that in mind. For more information, speak with Sister Dana. And as always, we could use help here at the church. So we are always looking for volunteers for the, for the children, uh, Sunday school and nursery Please speak with Sister Faith or Sister Alyssa when she gets back. For the tech team, you see these boys over here, they have been so faithful in helping us with the sound, the PowerPoint, the lighting, and even our live stream. So when you guys are not able to make it, it's because of their willingness to serve that we are able to watch on Facebook and even YouTube. For those who have not uh, known, we have our service uploaded on Facebook and YouTube every Sunday. And we could always use some help. So please speak with me or Sister Faith regarding that. And also for the worship team, we would love to have more and more people involved if that is something that God has called you. Now, does everyone have that calling? Maybe, maybe not, but that is between you and God. So please be in prayer regarding that, and please speak with us if so be it. And lastly, for ushers, we are always in need for people to represent the church as they receive the people who come here to TGIF. Just imagine the, the first impression that is on the minds of people as they come here at church. So ushers, door holders, greeters, that is of utmost importance. Setting up, tearing down, all of that comes into play when it comes to allowing us to have that corporate worship where we can fellowship and encourage the brethren. And lastly, the birthdays. So thankfully, Atafate's here because I would just done that and we would have sung. So Ate we Lucy. could celebrate the birthdays. Well, Tita Lucy, Kuya 
really now there are two Lucy's here. <laughs> Nana Lucy. Yeah, I love Lucy. <laughs> you, you know, you watch the <laughs> that thing. So all, all the birthday celebrants. Uh, Jethro, who's Jethro? Do you even know you're celebrating? Okay, Kuya Fred, Sister Donna, uh, Irvin, uh, Cicero, Joshua, and our anniversary in 19. So uh, every one happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday to to you I don't know if every one of us remember our spiritual birthday start celebrating that start celebrating because the significance of that is beyond our grasp so happy birthday everyone let us pray father thank you for our birthday celebrants we ask you to bless them with many years that are truly fruitful, meaningful, and joyful. Help them to endure the challenges ahead of them. We pray that you will use their lives, Lord, to bring the highest praise and glory to our Savior. We also thank you for the food that you have prepared for us. We thank you for the beautiful hearts and hands that prepared it. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, the one who came from heaven became a man and lived a perfect life. The one who spoke on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The one who no one took the ghost away but gave it up himself. And the one who was buried but on the third day he rose again. The one who showed himself his disciples so they are witnesses of his resurrection the one who ascended up to heaven and promised that he will come again to take us for where he is there we may be also to him be praise glory majesty and dominion forevermore amen, amen.